Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. In July of 2015, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany reached a historic accord with Iran, an agreement that in effect limits the Islamic Republic's nuclear program in return for international sanctions relief, which crippled Tehran's economy that was under dire distress. The move was perceived as an end to years of international isolation and the start of a new era in Iranian-Western relations. However, Tehran's persistence in advancing its ballistic program, missiles that can carry nuclear warheads, has raised new concerns on Iranian aspirations, as well as allegations on breaches of UN Security Council resolutions. With us to discuss this matter are Mr. Meir Javed Anfar, an Iranian expert from uh, the IDC in Herzliya. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Erdad Pardo, an Iranian expert from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, as well as from uh, Impact SE. Welcome. And I'd like to start with uh, a question to you, uh, Amir, when it comes to the, the perception of the situation post the nuclear agreement, there was some kind of hope by some people, skeptics on the other side, with regard to uh, whether this agreement would actually lay ground and will really uh, be established in a manner that would uh, heal many, many wounds which have been out there for quite some time now. Uh, give us a little bit of an understanding. What is the situation? Where is this going to? It remains to be seen how it will play out. Perhaps it is too soon to judge already. But if people are surprised by the fact that uh, there is no love lost yet between Iran and the West, one should be surprised by the surprise. Of course, there are many, many fields of competition in addition to the cooperation in the nuclear arena on one specific agreement. Even Britain and Argentina went to war over the Falklands, even though they are supposedly on the same side in the world. And yes, the uh, Iranian regime, as my colleagues here will specify, has many other aspirations. The nuclear business, you may call it a bomb in the basement, but usually it's the upper floor of international relations. Below this floor, there is a lot of competition. The United States and Russia, or earlier the Soviet Union, cooperated, had agreements, but still were rivals. And we are still in a stage where Iran and several of the Western countries are cooperating, are starting to develop commercial ties again. But nevertheless, there are disagreements regarding Iran's aggressive foreign and security policy. Mm. Uh, Mr. Javed Anfal, President Hassan Rouhani traveled to Paris, uh, where he met with uh, President Francois Hollande of France. Uh, together with a very broad traveling endeavor by Foreign Minister Javad Zarif uh, to all kinds of countries all over the world as well, uh, in an effort to really establish business ties post the nuclear agreement. But yet, there were certain countries left out, including the key player of the nuclear agreements, the United States, which uh, uh, the foreign minister, Muhammad Javad Zarif, stated was not ready to ensue in, nego uh, in any kind of business ties with Iran as of yet. Nonetheless, the United States has encouraged Iran to continue to assure the West and uh, international companies with regard to the sincerity of Iran and to tone down on rhetoric against Israel, against other nations in the region. Um, things that have not really come in as something um, acceptable by Iran, which defined, uh, for instance, its ballistic missile testing, which can carry also nuclear warhead and was spray painted with death to Israel. And uh, this is to the destruction of Israel. Uh, a lot of rhetoric against Israel stating this is for defensive purposes, signaling to the West, no, we're still a strong nation with a lot of pride. What is happening here? Is Iran some uh, uh, in a, a pickle of uh, domestic turmoil where one side wants one thing but the other wants another? Or is this an Iranian signal that nothing has changed, we're united in front of the West? Well, the Iranian political world is divided into two spheres. One is the regime, one is the government. 
The government of Mr. Rouhani has tried to reduce tensions with the international community. Even Mr. Rouhani said that our, our missile our program does not pose a threat to any country. Now, in the, in the, to the untrained ear, it doesn't sound much, but actually it's a signal also to Israel. Because before they usually just used to say we don't pose a threat to any country except Israel. Now they don't even say Israel. Why? Because Mr. Rouhani wants to reduce tensions because he needs something like 30 to 50 billion dollars of investment for Iran's economy. And he needs to work with the international community. He needs to have the French come in and build, for example, the Imam Khomeini airport so that the new Airbus 380 can land there and can get the passengers off because Iran does not have the capability to do it. And the IRGC does not have the capability to develop Iran's oil fields. So that's what he wants. So he's trying to reduce tensions. On the other side, you have the regime. And it's the regime which is responsible for the missile program, not the government. It's the IRGC, which is part of the regime, which is responsible for the uh, missile program. Number one, they are very concerned by the overtures of Mr. Rouhani in terms of reaching a deal with America and improving relations with Europe. Why? Because they see Glasnost was the factor which led to the disintegration of the Soviet Union. They see friendship as with the United States as a virus which, would, which basically led to the disintegration of the Soviet Union, and the same could happen to Iran. So they want to put a stop there, number one. And the missiles are just one way to do it. The other reason is, well, if you have French companies coming to Tehran and Austrians and British, then who's gonna, what's going to happen to the IRGC contract? They're going to lose out. So when you put these two together, the, the regime, which is mainly the revolutionaries, are going to insist on making sure that the West and Israel, especially Israel, is threatened because that's how they can keep their political and economic But who rules in the Iran currently, Dr. Pardo? Isn't the RGC the, the strongest military force in Iran these days? And isn't the regime the supreme uh, ruler of the Islamic Republic? Or is the government now garnering more and more powers in order to establish a new Iran which has uh, uh, good ties with the West? Well, I think what, what Mary said, and correctly, is that there is the regime, and the government. And so the government is like uh, under the regime. They, the, the, the government, uh, is this is an Islamic concept of shura, consultation. It's not a democracy, just consulting the leader. And uh, the leader's perception, and uh, they, uh, Rouhani and Khamenei work together for, for decades. The, the pragmatic wing of Rafsanjani Rouhani in the 1990s, and also during the uh, negotiation between 2003 and 2005, their strategy is to uh, drive a wedge between Europe on the one hand, United States on the other. So they keep the big Satan, small Satan, and all the, the, the nuclear uh, and hegemony, all of this intact, as we've heard, while opening the doors uh, toward you, uh, Europe, getting uh, Peugeot, Airbus, all, 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 all the stuff that you could get from Europe. During the time of Ahmadinejad, either because of Ahmadinejad or because they wanted to push ahead with the nuclear program and also make the nuclear program a national uh, issue uh, other than Islam uh, itself, uh, then they try to make another balance, the West on the one side, and then a, a, a policy that tried to get closer to the East, to China, Japan, Korea, North Korea, all, all of these. It didn't work so well, and the, the pressure, the Americans were extremely successful in, 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 uh, in their pressure, sanctions, and so on. So now they reached the deal, and they returned to the former policy of uh, Dividing, dividing the West, and it seems it works. Mm -hmm. well. Please, it's not. It's not only the West, of course. You see that in the letter to the Security Council, Russia and China uh, are left out regarding the missile uh, test. Mm -hmm. uh, even the letter itself is a very weak protest. Uh, it, it goes on record. For the sake of our viewers, the letter is uh, a letter by France, uh, uh, the United States, Germany, and Britain, uh, Britain in which they. Uh, accused uh, Tehran of breaching a resolution by the UN Security Council, and what does this and actually? What are the implications of no, this? No, no implications because the uh, the uh, Security Council resolution was uh, phrased in such an ambiguous way to begin with, in order to enable the July Agreement. 
to, yes. to be signed. So it is, uh, it is no surprise. But even if you look only at the United States, and as Dr. Powder said, trying to, to drive a wedge between the United States and the European partners, not only the United States and the three Western European partners and Russia and China, uh, which are uh, going to veto anything, but even between the United States and Europe, the Iranians are masters at looking at the American domestic political scene. From 1980 on, when Khomeini torpedoed Jimmy Carter's re-election campaign, he did not let the 54 hostages from the embassy be out, not only until Carter lost to Reagan, but until the moment Carter left the presidency, January 20th, 1981, and Reagan was inaugurated. Now they are looking at the political scene and they see a Donald Trump. And you know, only earlier this week or the other day, Donald Trump had an interview with Bob Woodward of the Washington Post. A very interesting and even funny interview in which, among other things, he accused President Obama of not being a good deal maker the way he, Trump, is vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians. And he said, and Mayor would of course agree, the Persians are fantastic dealers. They know how to negotiate. We should have walked out of the negotiations. We should have actually thrown a tantrum and uh, shown them that we don't care if there is no deal. I could have done it. I have uh, been making deals regarding real estate or other businesses. So going back to the Iranians, they see a Trump as a possible next president of the United States. They would rather deal with an Obama, and perhaps they prefer a Hillary Clinton, and therefore we could see in the run-up to the elections this fall a new rapprochement between Iran and the United States on other fields, not only on the nuclear one. Mr. Javed Anfal, I'd like to hear your response with regarding to this on the one hand and on the other. You stated that uh, Hassan Rouhani, the president of Iran's said to the international community that nobody should be afraid of this ballistic uh, testing. It's a ballistic missile which can carry nuclear uh, warheads, something that has also more than just uh, a move or military uh, strategy testing for it. It is also a statement to the world that it is also capable to reaching a lot more. But at the same time, it did write all kind of writings on uh, this missile, stating that it is seeking the destruction of a specific state, and that is the state of Israel. So how does this, on the one hand, uh, say that, no, it's just, you know, for defensive purposes, as Javad Zarif stated, the foreign minister, but at the other hand, they write down, this is for the destruction but of that, Israel. That exactly shows the, the battle, the, the struggle between the regime and the government. Rohan is trying to reduce the damages caused by this by, by, the, by this testing, which was also done in order to undermine him. He needs to run for re-election in 2017. He needs to bring investors in Iran. His government owes $189 billion in terms of debts. Let me just give you an example. The Civil Service Pensions Fund, which is the second biggest pension fund in Iran, for the for last month, Persian month, between 21st of February to 21st of March, did not pay its people. They simply don't have the money. They're running a massive deficit and they need government help and the government doesn't have the money to pay so them. So where is this $150 billion everybody's talking about? Where did it go to? Well, first of all, Iran never received $150 billion. And I have to, uh, uh, to correct what my friend said here. My, uh, Mr. Oren said, you Persians are very good deal makers. I think the current regime in Iran is probably the worst deal maker in the country. Donald Trump said it. In the, well, <laughs> sorry, I, let's blame him. I, I only quoted him. Iran lost, Iran gave away its money to America as a hostage. You're talking about hostage. You know, that the $150 billion was hostage so that, Amer so that America could force Iran to do things it didn't want to. And at the end, Iran, the only thing received was its own money back. And also $150 billion, $100 billion of that money is tied up abroad. Iran, look, the Chinese didn't just deposit Iranian money in their banks because they think Iranians are nice people. That too is because they have to sign to promise to, to buy Chinese products and Chinese services. So Iranian money, Iran, according to Mr. Kerry, only received $50 billion. It's not $150 billion. And let's just say even if Iran received $150 billion, Mr. Rouhani has got $189 billion worth of debt. As we speak, he needs the money and he needs to bring in, he needs to bring in investors. And also I have to say another thing also. 
to show how much the struggle over the missile is reaching the top. Mr. Afsanjani, his office made a tweet, said the world of tomorrow is a world of uh, negotiations and conversations, not the world of missiles. Ayatollah Khamenei said this Friday, whoever says that, uh, if he says it out of uh, ignorance, then he shows he doesn't know. And if he says that based on knowledge, then he shows he's a traitor. This goes to show how the missiles have been a bigger issue inside Iran in terms of damaging relations between the government, which is Mr. Rouhani, and also Mr. Afsanjani to a lesser extent, and the regime. So yes, we in Israel have every right to be threatened by a regime that writes these things on its missiles, but we also have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that this is very much part of the struggle between those who want the, Repub the revolution to be normalized, which is Mr. Rouhani, and those who want it to continue, like Mr. Khamenei. Dr. Pardo, do you agree with that? And is this indeed uh, the understanding of the, the structure of Iranian leadership, where Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, he is indeed the supreme leader, or is there a shift in the power where uh, what President uh, Obama actually spoke about plenty of times, and many have ridiculed those statements in which there is a shift of power in Iran, and this shift is uh, nearing in. Well, bo both both things are right. The, the, the paradigm, the, the grand paradigm, is, as I said here in, in the past, is the, the piece of uh, Imam Hassan and Muawiyah, which, which means uh, th this, is, this is the par paradigm of this agreement. It's, the idea is to have a, a smooth transition of power from old revolutionary guard, meaning uh, Khamenei, to the next supreme leader. And part of the paradigm is to show that the enemy is a liar, is a cheater. This is definitely a part of the paradigm. It was, it was told, foretold by Khamenei before. This is a Shiite history. This is Islamic history. And, and, and this is his plan and, and what, what, what Mayor Javad Nafar said, the regime. These, these are classes. These, these are, there are many, many powerful people. Uh, I, I would say including Rafsanjani, M many people who have a lot, of, you know, those who want democracy or secular uh, regime, they are out of the pale. They, they, they are not participating. Mm -hmm. So these people, they want to see the revolution continue. The revolution needs the enemies and they are aiming at uh, building the empire. They are aiming at, 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 at taking over the Muslim holy places, Mecca and Medina, and then continuing. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact is some leaders in Iran have this plan doesn't mean that this will happen because they cannot control the future. They, cannot, they, they don't live forever. Uh, and, and history, the powers uh, inside uh, will tell. I, I cannot predict the future. May I make well, a no, short remark? Actually, I, I'd really uh, okay. want to ask you this next question. You were talking about the Iranians being masters of domestic politics in the United States and reacting upon different changes within the political sphere of the United States. But we have here a supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, who is, according to rumors, in stage four cancer, not far from his deathbed. And uh, is this some regime that we can actually negotiate with on the one hand? And at the uh, other hand, is this actually an agreement that can be um, uh, put with true foundations, considering that if suddenly a different supreme leader comes up, suddenly Hassan Wuhani, which uh, Mr. Meir Javid Anfar has stated, has certain aspirations for Iran, may just, you know, fly out the window. Well, Where is this happening? Well, obviously, the Iranians know that they are under a magnifying glass regarding their compliance with the provisions of the agreement. And they know that Benjamin Netanyahu, among others, perhaps even before others, will pounce on them if he finds that they are cheating. As Dr. Mm -hmm. Pado said, they are saying that the enemy is cheating and lying. But obviously, everyone is waiting to catch them at their cheating and then say that the uh, agreement is uh, null and void. But a couple of remarks regarding that. First of all, if you look at it from the perspective of uh, Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards, they have to tell their audience, okay, we signed an agreement, or Rouhani and Zarif signed an agreement regarding stopping our work for the next 10 years or so on the nuclear bomb. However, there are two other routes to what we need. And one of these two 
other than the weaponization and the uh, enrichment of the material, is having a vehicle, a platform for this nuclear bomb should the time come. So you see, we are not standing still. We are now working on the missiles so that uh, in due course, if we have a nuclear bomb or nuclear warhead, it will ride on this missile. But it uh, was in 1998, almost 20 years ago, that an American uh, survey headed by Donald Rumsfeld, who at that time was just a retired defense secretary, he was going to come back to the administration, had a very ominous report that in 2015, last year, the Iranians will have an intercontinental ballistic missile able to hit Washington and New York. It didn't happen yet. Now, should Israel be afraid of these missiles? The answer is no. First of all, because perhaps Netanyahu is waiting for a pretext to hit Iran, and they are not going to supply Israel with such a pretext. And secondly, because Israel has been hit for so many times over the last 25 years, from Iraq on, by Hezbollah, by Hamas, the population here uh, is almost immune to these attacks if they are conventional. And as long as the Shihab missiles and the other missiles do not carry nuclear warheads, one should see it as almost a natural development, not a positive one, but a natural one. Just so, don't forget Mr. also Jibbidon Arrow Jibbidon. system. Israel is equipped with the Arrow system sure. and it's equipped with satellite system and it's equipped with the, probably the best air force. Look, for Iran, there's another angle, there's another side of the coin here also. Um, one of the reasons why Iran develops its missile technology, let's just say there's a democracy in Iran tomorrow. Okay, Iran will still develop its missile technology, at least in the short term. The reason being is this, the Iranians are far behind in terms of making a fighter aircraft. They bought fighter aircraft from Russia, MiG-29s and Sukhoi-24, but even the Russians started cheating and not giving them the spare parts. Never mind the Americans, the Russians during sanctions were playing games with Iran, and this is on top of the fact that the S-300 missiles are eight years late and apparently only going to be delivered now, and and as the old saying goes, it's, seeing is believing. That's the downgraded level. So that's, yeah, it's like mm -hmm. having a 2007 antivirus on your PC re to receive an S-300 missile. Mm -hmm. this is, the, the Russians don't even use it. So when the Iranians look at these things, they say, okay, we also need deterrence. This, this, and I think this is across the board. We need to have some kind of deterrence so that tomorrow, if the Iraqis or just like the Iraqis or firing missiles at Iran, anybody else who threatens us, then we can use it as a kind of deterrence because we can't exactly use our air force. And let's be honest, the Iranians sent forces into Syria and it seemed that they didn't do too well. I mean, they, they suffered from casualties, they withdrew them, they withdrew the IRGC, now they're gonna send the army, let's yeah. see how well they do. So look, there are also those in Iran, which I think includes people who don't wanna threaten Israel, who don't see the missiles in order to threaten Israel, to see it as a genuine deterrence force. But as with everything else, there are those in Iran who see the survival of the Islamic Republic as being a revolutionary state. Mm -hmm. And that the core of Iran being a revolutionary state is to challenge the United States and especially the state of Israel. Dr. Paolo. I think, uh, you know, th this is, this is uh, de definitely correct, but uh, the, the question is how, how, how are you, what, what's the interpretation uh, against the back? Backdrop of, of, let, of, let me rely on this for you. Yeah. You have stated for many, many uh, years the same uh, aspirations of Iran, that Iran is seeking to dominate its region, it seeks to dominate the world, and uh, the rhetoric, doesn't matter how many agreements, it's just to stall uh, Western uh, aspirations for global peace in order to deceive them and reach a different result. Well... F fact of the matter, if, if you look today, where Iranians, uh, wh where you see Iranians, you see them in, in Yemen, you see them in Lebanon, you see them in Syria, you see them in Iraq, you see them in, in Afghanistan. So they are moving ahead uh, steadily and, 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 the, and, the, and they continue with the, with, with the project. And, and I want to add another thing. Look, look, look at Rouhani. The same strategy that he did in the 90s and between 2003 and 2005, I said it, but he gave a... a an interview before before the elections, and, and he explained, we reach a deal on the on the technological dimension of our security system that, that we already uh, control, that we have the, the good command. So we reached a deal about the centrifuges. We 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 had 150 uh, centrifuges. 
Now they are 2,000, 3,000, now we already now, uh, 10 years later, there, there are 6,000 or something along these lines. But uh, uh, with the, the, the deal that he had at the time with the European, it allowed him to do the USF, the uranium uh, conversion facilities in Isfahan, uh, to, to produce other technological dimensions. And of course, they worked in Parchin and they worked in, 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 other, in other places. The same today. What, what Mayor said is, is, is right on target that they have weaknesses in the defense system, whether it's Air Force, whether it, uh, it's actually building the bomb, whether whether are the, the missiles, the ballistic missiles, as, as we heard. So Rouhani said, fine, we have a deal. We, have, we know how to enrich. We can do it. In a year, we have it. So we have 20%, 70%, 60%. That's not important. In a year, we have the, the uranium. Now we need to work on the bomb. We need to work on the missiles. We need good airplanes. We need the deterrent. All of this. So they continue, and 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 they continue to send uh, boats to Yemen. Mm -hmm. You see them all over. They destroyed Iraq. They destroyed Iraq. America left Iraq, functioning democracy, exporting oil. Everybody happy. Came the Iranians, and here Iraq is destroyed. Sa same with Syria. You had peaceful demonstration of hungry farmers came Iran and they start shooting. They thought it, it's it's like the same, uh, you know, and mm. look what happens. We're running so, out of time. Um, last sentence from you, Mr. Amir Oren. I'll give each one of you a sentence, please. A self-defeating suggestion because people are watching us on television. But why don't you put it on mute? I don't mean our show. <laughs> I mean what the Iranians are showing because if you don't listen to what they say, it is important for the analysis, for the experts, but if you only watch what they do, as President Nixon used to say, watch what we do, don't listen to what we say, their actions will speak louder than words. Mir Javed Anfal, it's not what you say, it's what you do that defines you. Does that work with Iran? I think absolutely. I think it's the hardware Iran, the current military hardware Iran would have under any any system or any regime. It's the software that bothers us. And the software is that the revolutionaries in Iran keep calling for the elimination of another state. And as long as they do that, they're going to be masters of making enemies for themselves. Dr. Pardo, when it comes to the near future, any difference... Uh, to be anticipated? I, no, I, I think ideology matters. I, I agree that there is an inner debate in Iran. I'm not, you know, th there is an inner debate and, and there is, there are hundreds of universities, there are a lot of intellectuals. Thousands. It's, it's thousands. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not, it's something that is really difficult to, to predict or to control. The fact that the, the regime wants something doesn't mean that it will happen, but the regime... That's all the time that we have for today. Unfortunately, Dr. Eldad Pardo, thank you so very much for being here. Mr. Mir Javin Anfar, it's been a thank pleasure. You. Mr. Amir Oren, thank you so very much. I would like also to thank our viewers, and we will see you next week. You just watched Jerusalem Studio. If you were enriched by the program, please consider supporting Avon TV 7 Jerusalem. Call us at 0600-10077 or send your donation using the bank account reference number on the screen. You can also donate via PayPal. Jerusalem Studio is made possible by your donation.